If you'll turn in your Bibles to that passage that we read together earlier on, Psalm 121, I'd like to spend some time this evening reflecting upon the lessons that we can learn from this psalm. There's a story told of C.H. Uh, Spurgeon that there was one occasion when he was not prepared uh, for the Sunday morning sermon and he went to bed on the Saturday night without having uh, worked out what he was going to preach and uh, during the night his wife was woken up by him uh, he was asleep but he was preaching in his sleep and uh, so she took the notes of the sermon that he was preaching in his sleep gave it to him when he woke up in the morning and he promptly went and preached that sermon uh, the following uh, that Sunday morning now I tell that story because I was sufficiently unprepared uh, that it was when I got up this morning I thought well now what shall we share together this evening and my thoughts were immediately directed to uh, the first verse of Psalm 121 I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help and so uh, I sat out in our garden early this morning re reflecting upon this psalm and the lessons that it can offer to us uh, God's people now the first thing you notice about this psalm is it's called a song of ascent or a song of degrees no one's quite sure what that title means but most scholars have come to the conclusion that these 15 psalms from 120 to 134 which are all given this same title are, are songs that were a small collection that were regularly sung as God's people went up uh, year by year to the annual feasts uh, in Jerusalem and that seems to fit quite well actually the pattern of these 15 psalms what's also interesting in them uh, is that they seem to divide into five sets of three uh, I think my sums are up to five threes of fifteen I think that's correct uh, and the interesting thing is that each of uh, most of the first psalms of the three so Psalm 120 Psalm 123 and so on uh, each of those seem to start away from God some distance from the place of worship uh, the third psalm uh, in these cycle of psalms uh, seem to be located in Jerusalem itself or where God's people are worshipping and the middle psalm uh, is the psalm that especially emphasises uh, the pilgrim journey you'll notice that in, in these three psalms of which Psalm 121 is one in Psalm 120 uh, there is the reference to the fact that in my distress I called to the Lord and he heard me well where is the psalmist when he cries out uh, well woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech that I dwell in the tents of Kedar uh, he's a long way from the place of worship Psalm 122 I was glad when they said unto me let us go to the house of the Lord our feet are standing within your gates O Jerusalem he's moved, the psalmist has moved from Kedar and Meshech to Jerusalem and our psalm is in the middle our psalm is a psalm of the journey it's a pilgrim psalm so that's the background to this psalm as we begin to look at it and one of the interesting things about this psalm is that one word repeats itself time and time again actually it repeats it more often in the original Hebrew than it does in the English he verse 3 he that keeps you will not slumber verse 4 behold he that keeps Israel verse 5 the Lord is your keeper and the same word actually lies behind verse 7 the Lord shall preserve he will keep he shall keep your soul the Lord shall keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore so this psalm is about the Lord's keeping of his people and where does he keep them? well verse 1 I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help most 
versions of the Bible, including the one that you have in front of you, the Church Bible, has a question mark at the end of verse 1. The old authorised version didn't. But most versions have a question mark. And I think properly there is a question mark there. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. Now if you were an ancient pilgrim in Palestine those many centuries ago and you were going up to Jerusalem there are, you would be taking the lower route uh, you would be taking a route through valleys amidst mountains and hills around you and on those hills from time to time you would see a grove a temple not to the Lord God but to the pagan deities that were worshipped in the land now that's the background of verse 1. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, or I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? In, in this environment uh, in, in, in which spiritual forces hostile to God are celebrated and worshipped, where does my help come from? In a world that is under the thrall of Satan and his powers, where does my help come from? And the psalmist answers his own question. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now those of you who are biblically literate, and I know this congregation I think well enough to know that you're all biblically literate, will hear an echo when I read that verse. The Lord made heaven and earth. And you don't need me to remind you that that's a quotation from the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the psalmist is going back uh, to the most fundamental, the first truth about God that is revealed in the Bible. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And in the idiom that you find in the Old Testament, to, for God to create the heaven and the earth means he's created everything. If you and I had uh, gone outside and I'd have said, you know, here we are on the earth and what's that up there? You'd have said, that's the sky. And we would have actually uh, embraced all the reality we saw out there as sky and earth. And the psalmist does that and the Old Testament does that. So that when there is a reference here to the heavens and the earth, it means God created everything. And of course, as you read through Genesis chapter 1, that's precisely what we're told. When God created the heavens and the earth, says, says Genesis chapter 1, this is what it was like and this is what he did. But there's one significant change from Genesis 1, verse 1, to Psalm 121, verse 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Here, the psalmist says, God, it is the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is God's personal name. It's the name that was revealed to Moses. Who shall I say sent me, says Moses, uh, to the angel, who, the God who appeared in the angel in the bush. Who shall I say uh, sent, sent, sent me? And he says, I am the Lord. And so when the psalmist here appeals to God being the creator of all things, uh, he has added something. He has added that revelation of God that followed when God revealed his name. It's an interesting name. It's actually an ambiguous name. Uh, it could be translated, I will be who I will be. So when Moses says, who sent me? Or when they ask, who sent you? Who shall I say? God says, I will be who I will be. Just wait and see is my name. And what the Lord then did was to fill out the meaning of his name. To explain what it meant. All the history of God's people then and indeed to this very day fill out what it means to be the Lord. I will be who I will be. But in particular, Israel came to recognise the Lord 
as the one who was gracious, loving, tender-hearted and utterly committed to his people. So you see, an answer to the psalmist's question, his own self-answer is, my help comes from the creator God, the redeemer of his people, who has committed himself 110% to me and God's people. It's a pretty good place to start when seeking reassurance in the face of hostility and difficulty. But I want you to notice that the psalm doesn't finish there. Now, I don't know whether you've noticed in reading through the psalms, but very often uh, they change voice. You remember first, second and third person when we were having to learn English grammar at school? I, you, me, uh, he, she, they. Well, notice that this psalm changes. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. So what's going on here? There's a lovely story told in the early records of the Broadmead Baptist Church uh, in Bristol, one of the oldest Baptist churches uh, in England, indeed in the world. There's a story told that when they first started, uh, that uh, because they were opposed to all forms of liturgy, God should be worshipped freely and by his spirit. So they were opposed to all forms of prayer books or whatever it was. So they used to go along to the service in the parish church after the the prayers had taken place and just come in so that they could hear the sermon. The assumption being that the preacher uh, uh, had been led by God's spirit in the words that he had to say. And then they would leave. One of the lovely stories associated with it is that one of, the, uh, one of the curates, his wife was a member of this new Baptist group uh, and uh, she found it very offensive that her husband was reading prayers and, and doing all these sorts of things and so she separated uh, uh, with her group from the parish church and set up the Baptist church. But it says in the Broadmead Baptist records that though she left her ch- his church, she never left his bed. Well, that's reassuring. The marriage remained stable, uh, even if they went their different routes as far as it was uh, then and there. Um, but why do I refer to that? Well, you know, some of us uh, come from traditions where we emphasise the need to be spirit-led in our worship. And we tend to uh, look down our noses somewhat at the group down the road who are reading out of a prayer book. Well, I want to suggest to you that we're wrong to do that because actually what lies behind this psalm here is precisely the sort of thing you might have found in a prayer book. Different voices are responding, uh, are expected to speak at different points of the reading of the psalm. So the single voice says in verse 1, Uh, and two I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help my help comes from the name of the Lord which made heaven and earth and either a chorus or another voice responds and says he will not suffer thy foot to be moved he that keeps Israel will not slumber and then another voice comes in and says behold he that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep then the the second responding voice comes in uh, the Lord is thy keeper the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand and the second voice comes in and responds Uh, we have here a very dramatic liturgical psalm. Now the the significant thing for us is this, that the psalmist in the face of his own need for reassurance that God keeps goes back to theological basics, to his the basic teaching of scripture. He reminds himself that it is the Lord who is the creator of heaven and earth. But that is not enough. He needs other voices. And it's a gentle reminder to you and me, you know, uh, of the importance of Christian fellowship, of the importance of supporting others, of the importance of meeting together as God's people to reassure one another of those things that we know are true 
but where more than one testimony is reassuring and strengthening. Now you know that. I'm teaching grannies to suck eggs. Of course you know that. But it's a good reminder. And perhaps it's a gentle reminder to us to look out for those who need to be reassured of God's keeping. And be able to get alongside of them and say, Brother, sister, remember what God's word says. Remember your past experience. At risk. Can I give you a word of testimony? And why not make sure you're there on Sunday so you don't lose touch with those truths that you uh, need to build on in order to reassure yourself of God's keeping of you? Well, we must move more speedily through uh, the rest of this psalm. But what in particular do these other voices appeal to? Verse 3. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keeps thee will not not slumber. Behold, he that keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. My wife attempted the moonwalk in May. She was going extremely well. She had done nine miles in a very uh, speedy time and then she tripped over an uneven paving stone and ended up in hospital. Uh, I have uh, teased her a good deal about it, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, uh, as to why it was that uh, she didn't look where she was going, uh, and so on and so forth. But you know as well as I do uh, that we can be in situations where uh, something completely unexpected, unforeseen, unplanned for, can catch us out. And that's what the psalmist is reflecting on here. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He will protect you, he will keep you from that unexpected danger, the banana skin that you can't spot. Why will he do that? Because he neither slumbers nor sleeps. He doesn't nod off and he doesn't fall into a deep sleep. He is always alert. He is the guard. He is the ultimate guard. He is there and awake. Now what's interesting here is this. He who keeps Israel, and in the Hebrew text actually, the the one who keeps Israel is is emphasised. Right at the end, the the, the sentence structure is, is reversed so that the emphasis falls upon these two words. Uh, keeps Israel one of the things you notice as you read through the Bible is how often especially the Psalms argue from the greater to the lesser or the lesser to the greater now when you're reading your Bible next time round and as you're reading over the coming weeks notice that it argues either from the greater to the lesser or the lesser to the greater here it argues from the greater to the lesser. If he keeps Israel, he will keep you. If he looks after his people, you're not excluded from his care. If he is the God who has made heaven and the earth, yet such is the precision and fine working of the one who is our God that you and I are within the sphere of his detailed keeping. We need to do that to ourselves sometimes, you know. Well, it's true for you, it's true for them, but it's not true for me. The Bible says if it's true, it's true for me too. If it's true for us, it's true for me. If it's true for me, it's true for you. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. God will keep you from those unexpected, unplanned for banana skins that we simply cannot predict. But that's not all it says. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The moon and the sun are a little bit more predictable than the banana skin. They're there, routinely. They come and they go. Uh, And... uh, 
yet they bring with them their own personal challenges. If any of you have ever been to Israel, you know how important it is to ensure that you get sufficient shade and water because of the temperature uh, of the countryside there. Uh, shade is vital. Otherwise, sunstroke. There are those, of course, who also speak of moonstroke. Uh, somebody can be moonstruck, uh, and we suggest that they might have uh, addled their brain slightly. Uh, perhaps there is something of that idea here too. Not only will God keep us through the day-to-day -day affairs uh, in which we find ourselves, but also he will especially protect us, uh, both personally and physically and also protect our minds from danger if we keep our minds fixed upon him. And it's just possible too that the emphasis on the night here or the moon reminds us of darkness. The darkness when evil stalks. As I was reflecting upon this early on it seems to me at least that uh, verse 6 is deliberately vague. It enables you or I to fit in whatever we might of our experience of sun or moon and say, he keeps. But if that thought of the evil that stalks at night is in the picture here, then that provides a link, doesn't it, to the last couple of verses. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Actually that brings us full circle, doesn't it? The, f the first verse is concerned with the presence of those evil powers that are opposed to God. The so-called gods who are worshipped on the high places. Those powers that are evil and opposed to God. Powers that are present in our world. We see it sometimes more obviously, sometimes less obviously in our own experience and the experience of those around us. I remember a story from when I was about six. We had a missionary visiting us from the Belgian Congo, as it then was. And uh, she was a very uh, balanced lady. She was a nurse. Uh, uh, she was Welsh and she told the story how when walking through the jungle sometimes uh, it was uh, rocks would cascade out of the sky and bounce off an invisible umbrella about six feet above her head. She was bearing testimony to Jesus and there are powers of darkness that were present uh, in that culture and those powers of darkness were unleashing themselves against her but she found the Lord kept. Now it may not be quite so obvious to you or to me as that sometimes although there have certainly been experiences in my own life where the only explanation is that this is spiritual attack. But notice what the psalm tells us. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. I love the expressions here. All could be better translated every single evil. All of them. No exceptions. The Lord keeps his people from every attack. He preserves from every attack he preserves everywhere we go. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in. Well, if you go out and come back, that is pretty much everything in your life, isn't it? We're going in and out all the time. And that's the picture here. He will preserve you wherever you are. And he will do so from this time and forever. It's not time limited. It's not space limited. Uh, it's not 
Uh, it doesn't bracket out those particular attacks of the evil one. It includes everything. All comes under the embrace of the, word, the Lord's character as the keeping one. Now the reality is that it doesn't always seem like that. Lord, Father, take this cup from me. Yet nevertheless, not your will, not my will, but your will, be done. It doesn't always seem like it. And this psalm wouldn't have been penned if it always did seem uh, like it. It's precisely in the context of where am I going to find my help that the reflection of faith and the words of faith declare the truth of God. That's actually why probably the psalmist needs other people to chip in and say I agree with you or what about this? Uh, it is to ensure that when we are in the dark place, when we are in the valley, when we are in the place where uh, the devil seems to be winning hands down, it's at that point that we say he is my keeper. Psalm 123 says the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 121 says the Lord is my keeper. And just as Psalm, 121, Psalm 23 can speak about the psalmist going through the valley of the shadow of death, that he is with me, the same could be said here. As I undertake my pilgrimage, not necessarily a pilgrimage from Meshach and Kedar to Jerusalem, but your and my daily walk with God, we have the reassurance that whether it is in sunlight or in dark he is my keeper so it's a terrific psalm it's a psalm that is addressed to us all it's addressed to us if we're in the dark place it's addressed to us if we're not in the dark place with a warning that we may well find the dark place in golf sands at some point or another it's a reminder that even if we're in the daylight there are others who are in the darkness who need a word of encouragement and support and a reminder that the Lord is my keeper. Now, one final point, and that's this. The prayer book that Jesus used was this prayer book. It was Psalm, the book of Psalms. Jesus sung these psalms. Jesus memorised these psalms. Jesus took these psalms and not infrequently applied them to himself. His disciples took the psalms and said, you see, they tell us something about Jesus. If you and I want the sub sublime evidence that God keeps, we only have to look at the cross. For there... God met with us in our profoundest need. He supplied our need. And he ensured that we would be kept unto that inheritance that is undefiled, that is reserved for us, that will not fade away. He is keeping us in Christ for glory. Let's pray together. We thank you, our Father, for your word. We thank you for its realism. It speaks to us not where we might think we ought to be or where others might think we should be, but it addresses us where we are with all our needs, our anxieties, our concerns, the pain and the suffering that accompany the pilgrim way, the threat that we experience at the hands 
of him who is the arch enemy of God. And we thank you for these words. The words that remind us that you, our Redeemer, are our, our, our Keeper. That he who, through whom the heavens were made and the earth was framed, even the Son who became our Saviour in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he too is our Keeper. And so we rest content. Yet we pray that you would strengthen and keep us when we ourselves feel perturbed and troubled. When our circumstances are disrupted, when our futures are unclear, when the powers of darkness seem to throw the kitchen sink at us, help us to hold fast to this truth 